Welcome to The Quantum State, a podcast exploring the latest research and innovation in quantum computing. Join us as we dive into groundbreaking breakthroughs, trends, and news shaping the quantum landscape. Discover the cutting edge developments pushing the boundaries of computing technology. Through insightful discussions, expert interviews, and in-depth analysis, we unravel the intricate theories and real-world applications driving this transformative field. The Quantum State also offers updates from BTQ, sharing the company's research progress and innovative products at the forefront of quantum computing. So embark on this mind-bending journey with us as we navigate the realm of quantum computing, witnessing its potential to revolutionize our world. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Quantum State. I'm here today with my co-hosts, Peter and Gavin, and today we have Nick Farina, the CEO of ArrowQ, but he's also an investor in the quantum technology space and since 2018 has been writing about the ethics and governance of quantum technologies. So this is going to be a really exciting and varied perspective, so I'm really excited to talk to you about all of this. Thanks for being on The Quantum State. Thank you so much for having me, Anastasia, and the rest of the team. So first, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into the quantum computing space. Completely by accident. So I'm a, a software person, um, a software uh, founder, um, and uh, then later turned angel investor. So uh, to, to make the story short and in- interesting, um, I joined the board of a theater company, uh, as in literally like theater, like plays, in Chicago in 2011, and the boyfriend of the executive director was doing his PhD at Northwestern um, in experimental physics. And I just thought it was the coolest thing. The stuff he told me about what he did in the lab every day was so exciting and invigorating to me. Um, I enjoy software. Um, I enjoy coding, although I'm not not great at it. I don't claim to be a, a brilliant coder by any means, but I had gotten a little bit disenchanted with the software startup space. So that can be my first controversial statement of uh, of our of our talk. Um, and I immediately was like, "Wow, you know, the work that you're doing, you know." using these crazy machines, you know, to cool things down to the temperature of outer space immediately made me want to learn more. So this was, that was 2011. And then, uh, and that was my um, co-founder, Professor Johannes Polinen. Um, And then he went to Caltech to get a a postdoc. And I was in California quite a bit. So we stayed in touch and I got to learn more about quantum, quantum technologies um, in general during his time at Caltech because I was getting more interested. um, And so I would always ask him questions. We stayed in touch. And then the way that ArrowQ began was immediately, a lot of people, they are professors for a while and then they do a spin out. But immediately after joining MSU almost, Johannes and I sat down over a beer and said, and I said, what are you going to do with your research? And he said, with your new research group, and he said, you know, well, there's, you know, about, you know, 10 or so ways to build a quantum computer. But I think there's one way that really has been underexplored and could offer the best of all worlds. And that's what I'm going to do with my research group. And I said, you know, that sounds like something that might have some commercial value, And it also sounds like something that's a a heck of a lot more interesting than what I'm doing right now. So um, let's start a company together. And that is how ArrowQ began, how I got into quantum computing. Um, And so thanks to many resources, Anastasia, uh, you uh, among the creators of them, um, I I kind of had an unfair advantage because we have two professors at our company. So I kind of had the benefit of being of having two private professors uh, for the last seven years to learn about quantum computing. Um, but it was certainly a steep learning curve, but one that I found 
to, to be worthwhile. Uh, so I got into this by accident and um, it's now been uh, over seven years um, and I've been um, loving every minute of it. That's awesome. I, I, I love those sort of stories, right? Because I think I get a lot of questions, right? How did you decide that quantum computing was going to be so great? Like, you, did you know it was going to take off? And I was like, nope, I just kind of fell into it. I thought it was really yep. cool. I had some research in there and it just seemed awesome. And I went for it. Yep. It, it was, it was the coolest thing going, you know? Um, and uh, I, I should mention that there was, there was uh, the story of how AeroQ began is that it was a marriage of, of different, of two different pieces. So at Northwestern, Johannes was um, uh, really focused, was uh, not looking at quantum computing, um, but was generally ultra, ultra low temperature experimentalist, um, you know, with the uh, emphasis on superfluid helium. Um, and so then what we do at our company is build quantum computers using electrons floating on helium. So he wasn't really thinking about quantum computing when I met him. So that's an important part of the story too, is that when we met, we were just talking about science because we thought science was cool. Um, quantum computing was nowhere on the radar. Uh, but then when he got to Caltech, everyone was talking about quantum computing and then that's how he got the interest for his uh, research group. But, but exactly, Anastasia, I, I, I came into this just because I, I thought the science involved in, in ultra low temperature experimental physics was uh, just way cooler than anything that I had ever been involved with before. And it's a privilege to this day to be involved in that. The, um, the coolness factor is certainly a, a common theme you hear, not just people going in from investing, but going into it as a career as a whole from any angle. Quantum has a coolness factor. I guess from an investment perspective, anything that's cool, but also uh, perhaps not so well generally understood brings all sorts of potential risks and hazards. Uh, can you outline what some of those are? If, if you're an investor wanting to get into the quantum space where reality is the average person isn't going to be aware of lots of the nuances. It would be very easy to fall into a trap or be misled, whether it be intentional or not. What are the red flags, the green flags? How do you how do you differentiate what's good from not good? Uh, Peter, I'm very worried that we're going to see a lot. Uh, you know, right right now, people talk. You know, we're we're talking now at the end of uh, 2023. And, you know, people already are rightfully so complaining about quantum hype and some quantum scams and whatnot. And it, I'm, I will tell you right now, it is going to get so much worse. Well, the fact um, that we have a special term for this already, a quantum yeah. hype, already says a lot. Yeah, 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 that's exactly, you know, and, and, and I, I think, I, I think it's going to start to get worse. And, and, and this is because... It's an area where it's very easy to uh, to dazzle people with uh, putting up a bunch of of expressions on a board and saying, "Oh, you know, look, look at all this math." You know, I, you know, and then someone says, "Oh, well, I, I don't understand that, but that that looks right. That must be good." Um, and there's it, it's it's also very difficult to find the right markets because there's a lot of great. Uh, so you have what a couple of buckets. You have the bucket of someone who's going to be investing in the technology um, that uh, is is just falling victim to a scam, uh, or at the very least, someone who really doesn't know what they're doing, even if they're not intentionally trying to be a scammer. Um, and then the second category, there are a lot of really interesting quantum technologies that I've seen that do not have a large enough addressable market to create a return on investment. And this is another uh, issue as well. Um, so you could have, so normally when you invest in startups, when I've invested in startups in the, in the past, it's really all about the team and the market size. And if, if you've got a big market size and a great team, then they can usually navigate and pivot their way through challenges and obstacles. 
And in quantum technologies, I, I'm not so sure that's the case. Um, you, you can easily see a great team that is simply addressing too small of a market um, or is, uh, you know, pursuing a technology that they have every intention of making work, but this is still experimental in many ways, so it, it might fail. So you have those two categories. Um, and I'm a big believer in this field, and I think that over the next, I don't think we've even begin, begun to see uh, the amount of hype that we're about to as we start to get more traction, um, as, you know, let, let, let's all hope soon we, you know, one day see quantum advantage. Um, and, you know, once we get to quantum computing and other quantum technologies becoming more mainstream, you know, just this year on the cover of Time magazine, there was a whole feature of quantum computing. So you're walking through the airport and you're seeing a picture of a cryostat. So this is becoming mainstream, and there's a relatively small talent pool. And so I, I, I won't go on too long about this, but what I, where I think the key problem is that you're going to see a huge amount of people who are going to want to get in on the gold rush. But unfortunately, and we have a lot of work to do around this, and this feeds into ethics, the pipeline of people who are qualified to work on the technology, let alone work on the technology with a good business plan, is much, it's a supply and demand issue. It's much smaller than the amount of people who are going to want to get involved in the field. So right. I, I think a lot of people are going to lose money in the field, unfortunately. Yeah. So just to follow up on that, I, I notice that many quantum companies, uh, which is completely reasonable for you know the, the, the field at this stage, are are viewing their their first customers as the government uh, because the government has the money and you know generally they want to advance new technologies for sovereign capability and uh, you know as an investment which could have payoff down the road. Um, but you know so the government may not be the best. Uh, <laughs> the best institution uh, to to know what the market demand for some of those technologies is, uh, and a lot of it, you know, basically they're just working off of reports produced by consulting firms. Um, so I wonder if if you'd be willing to elaborate a little bit on some of the technologies you think maybe don't have such a big market, or it's not clear that are quantum related. Sure. I, I, um, that, that, that's a great question. Um, you know, some of the technologies I think, well, and then I should also add, you have crowded spaces too. Um, so I think one example are quantum random number generators. Um, so this is a field that both has it, it the market size is, is unclear, um, but there are so many people that are working on it, attacking the problem, um, and that that is a product alone. I've seen maybe 100 pitch decks. Now, incorporated into a suite of products, then sure, that might make sense. But I think QRNG is one example of, you know, it, with that as a standalone product, people say, oh, you know, this is what we're going to do. Um, and here are some of the use cases. And there are use cases, certainly use cases for the government. Um, but you run into a you know relatively limited market size there, and you also have a lot of competition. Um, and, and, and that that's that's the the other thing that makes investing even more complicated is that in a lot of the fields that are, high potentially high value for investing like quantum computing itself um, um, like post quantum security like the folks are doing at BTQ um, a lot of these areas um, you do see a lot of competition and it's not clear whether it will be winner take all I don't think it's going to be winner take all I think that's the good news I think that the markets for the large applications or the large ones are going to be big enough to support 
um, multiple winners and multiple success stories. Um, you know, what, what are, what are some of the other ones? You know, I, I, I've seen a lot of what I would call pet projects that aren't even products. So, so, so Gavin, when you ask about examples of, um, uh, you know, tech, uh, uh, technologies that are too small, some of them are, aren't even technologies yet. <laughs> you know, there are companies that are being spun out um, based on a few research papers with that do not yet even have a cohesive um, technology developed around it. It's mm -hmm. just sort of like a, a, a number of ideas um, and the pieces are trying to get put together. And that's something that I also see a lot too. So I think those are a few quick examples. Right. Do you think that, so there's some discussion, you're very active on quantum Twitter, right? So we have a lot of these ethical discussions sometimes in public and people having commentary there. But do you think yeah. for these companies, you mentioned something about, you know, the team can pivot. When you're coming out of the university, sometimes you're doing technology transfer, the team is very focused on a certain technology. So pivoting is almost a little bit harder there, right? Because if you're looking at hardware, pivoting to a different type of hardware is, is a completely different ball game, right? But do you think that that's, I mean, is that feasible? And we've also seen some companies pivoting to the classical side, right? Yeah. And yes. so do you feel like that's a little bit like giving up? Um, or is that kind of the right way that we can kind of build the quantum ecosystem over time along with that classical ecosystem? So and I, I would break it down into, is it possible and is it a good idea? Um, is it possible? Yes. Um, is it difficult? Extremely. Uh, it certainly depends on, on what avenue you're going down. Pivoting is one of the most useful toolkits that any startup can have. And one challenge that we have in quantum technologies is that we, we don't we don't have it easily in our toolkit. Um, my last company um, that was uh, that was successful, um, and I was about to say I, I I never judge fellow entrepreneurs who are doing their best because I, I myself have um, have started failed companies. Um, but the last company that I was with that was that was successful um, executed at least three pivots. Um, and was able, and that is what was able to keep the company alive for so long. Um, but with quantum tech, you've got people, uh, it, it's on the one hand, it's a benefit because you have a moat, right? You have people who have PhDs, who have incredible depth of knowledge. Um, and, and you don't even necessarily need a, a PhD to add value, but you know, often um, that's where these companies are coming from, coming out of, out of universities and labs. And so that makes it very difficult to pivot. Um, and is, is going to, and, and I'll, I, I won't ignore the question about, is it giving up to, to go to classical? Um, you know, I don't think it's giving up if you have a good reason for it. Um, if, if you're doing it just because you're running out of money and you want to throw a spaghetti at the wall and see what might stick, um, that's not going to be successful because you, a pivot when it's done correctly at a startup has to be really well thought out and really well executed because they are, I, when I said it's a very something handy to have in your toolkit, but it's also something that needs to be um, really, really um, done correctly. And um, the, it, it's hard to pull off. So you, if, you're, if you're kind of abandoning quantum for a while, um, there's also a risk of losing ground. And I think that's something that's important to note too, is that other companies that are going, that are in the quantum tech space, regardless of which type of quantum technology we're talking about, um, you know, they're, they're, they're not going anywhere. They're, they're sticking in, in, in the field, um, including some that have also expanded. 
So, you know, Zapata, for example, his expan- his, is still working on quantum problems, even though they're also, you know, working on some classical AI issues. So I, I, I think to, to summarize, it's very difficult. One of, the chal- one of the many, many, many challenges, this is a very hard field. One of the many challenges is that if you look at history, um, almost all successful startups have pivoted, you know, once or twice in their lifetimes. And in quantum technologies, that's difficult to do, sometimes impossible, and that makes it riskier. There's one sort of broad distinction, I guess, in the industry that I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on. The, the distinction between companies that are focusing on hardware versus software, similar to in the conventional IT space, there are quantum companies going all in on a particular hardware platform. This is the type of physical qubit we're going to build, and they're betting on that, making it towards full-fledged quantum computing. Then there are companies that are doing the equivalent of developing full-stack software development kits. Uh, those have very different considerations uh, from an investment perspective in terms of the risks associated with them. What are your thoughts on how to treat those different subsectors uh, differently? Uh, you know, the you software is going to be easier to do diligence on um, because it has uh, more in common with what more what most investors know uh well it depends on the type of software if we're talking about a really 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 um you know complex uh software company that is focusing on you know building out algorithms for clients that are looking at for example drug discovery that might not be so easy to do to do diligence on but timeline becomes really important here um, because my opinion is that hardware companies are ultimately going to uh, capture the, ma- the majority. Um, that doesn't mean all by any means, but you know I think because of the level of because that's where the the, pro- the bottleneck is is in the hardware. And obviously, I'm biased running a hardware company. I, I'll admit that. Um, you know, but I, I think a lot of the end value is going to wind up in hardware. Um, but so on the other hand, it's, it's, it takes a much longer time, uh, to, to, to get to some type of proof of concept. It takes a much longer time to get customers. If you have customers, uh, we, we have no customers and we do not plan on having customers for the next two years. Um, and you know, any investor watching this already knows that. (laughs) <laughs> because we we've told it to them, um, you know that that's in our, our our plan. So you know we're really talking about a in our case it was nine years of R and D. So you have to have I would say a different type of temperament. So a really quick example is if you're going to be investing in quantum hardware, that's pretty similar to investing in biotech, for example, where you you take a long, long time with no money coming in the door, but you're creating something that's so valuable that at the end, it's able to be sold for a gazillion dollars and everyone has a successful outcome. Um, I, I, I like to say that it's easier than biotech because you don't have to worry about getting approvals for a new medicine or whatnot. Um, so if you're going to be in, so I put it this way, if you're going to be investing in hardware, you have to think about it. You, you have to talk to people who have invested in biotech before and, and, and sort of learn what it feels like to have your money locked up for many, many years, but then potentially to have an absolutely gigantic outcome. I think software companies are going to have a shorter pathway to exit, um, but with, the, with a few potential exceptions, are going to have a smaller final exit. The other benefit of software is that it's less capital intensive. So you don't have to raise as much money. Hardware companies have to raise a lot of money. 
And as a result, there's a lot of, of pressure to sell the company for huge sums of money uh, to make it worthwhile. So um, one final thing I'll say is that it's easier um, as a smaller investor to invest in either software um, or networking or communications where other than QKD perhaps, um, which is, uh, which is ex expensive um, because your, your dollars are going to go further. Uh, whereas with hardware, you might, if, if you're writing, you know, checks of a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollars, and the company has to raise five hundred million dollars, ultimately you're going to get diluted so much that your stock isn't going to be worth anything. So um, I, 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 I hope that answered the question, but I really see them as is almost two entirely separate categories and profiles of investment. Sure. So I, for example would not invest in a quantum hardware company other than my own, not because I don't believe in it, but because I can't afford it. Um, you know, I, um, I, I can't write, you know, $10 million uh, investment checks that you need to support a quantum hardware company. Um, I've made investments um, in uh, quantum uh, networking um, and in, in, in quantum software. Um, but again, that's just because there's different levels of entry points at different areas, but I think they're really separate categories for investors. So where do you think the, the earliest applications of quantum technologies will show up or will actually see products that are being bought? I, so I, I'm not, um, our company is 100% focused on, we're, we're a fabulous semiconductor company. Don't worry, I'll answer the question. Uh, we're, so our company, um, we don't focus on applications. Uh, so I rely on my, the opinions of the experts that I know on the application side and on our advisory board. And I have heard, I would say the consensus from everyone that I know in the field uh, is in drug discovery um, and um, in inventing uh, new medicines. And this is also something that I'm very passionate about, um, you know, having, you know, lost uh, many um, family members and friends to diseases, um, whether it be death or disablement. Um, and the uh, quantum computing pairs up somewhat nicely, uh, naturally in some ways, uh, with uh, drug discovery as, you know, they're also uh, both quantum systems. Um, so I both think, uh, based on the opinions of the folks that I know who know what they're talking about, um, and I'm also optimistic and hopeful um, that those are the first applications that we see. Um, and I think that's going to get a lot of people excited. And I'm going to go there on the record and say that we're going to see, um, I, I think we'll see some type of quantum advantage on a two to three year time horizon. So I, I think we are no longer uh, in the five year uh, period uh, where it's always five years away that people like to joke. But, you know, if you just look at the advances that are being made, I, I, I see it as a snowball. Uh, where you have error correction, you have more efficient algorithms, and you have uh, better hardware. Um, so I know that we're going to be bringing better hardware to market. I know that our competitors are as well, which will advance the field, and we're very happy for them to do so. Um, you know, I, I the advances in error correction with uh, exciting things like quantum LD, L, L, LDPC codes, um, and then more efficient algorithms, you know, doing more with less. Um, I think all these three things are happening at once. And so I, I think that we'll see quantum advantage in two to three years. Um, I, I hope that's not a promise. Um, obviously, none of us know. Um, but the momentum, I think, has been strong in all the three areas that we need to get there. Um, and, and I think drug discovery is probably the lowest hanging fruit. So, so, I mean, this is a, 
as you say, a very, very impactful one if it works out. I mean, drug discovery is something that influences, that affects everyone ultimately. Um, and, and broadly speaking, the idea here is quantum computer can simulate drugs better because they're operating at a molecular level where it's quantum mechanical effects. So we get a better simulation. So is there a way of estimating in your mind or a way of having a gut feeling if quantum computers can do these simulations and outperform classical computers, to what extent is that likely to transform into actual discovery of incredible new drugs? I mean, it doesn't guarantee it. It's a possibility. How likely do you think it is? Is there a way to gauge that? <laughs> um, is there a way to gauge that? Uh, well, I'll also mention one other thing, which is that there's a there, there could be a potential first step which is just having a better understanding of the molecular modeling could allow us to get drugs that already are that already can be modeled to market faster. Um, so there is a really we talked about consulting reports earlier, uh, but there is a really good one by McKinsey um, called uh, Pharma's Digital Prescription, um, or that that Quantum is. And they make a very good point, which is that, yes, ultimately, we will be able to create breakthrough new medicines. Um, but in the b before that, um, we might be able to get medicines through trials faster um, because quantum computers um, in their in the molecular simulations will be able to, uh, you know, more will will will. We'll, be able to understand the compounds faster um, and that this will allow us to get medicines to market sooner. So there's two stages really, I think, and that might happen first, they might happen together, um, but that's in addition to, so those are medicines that we could already create today, but are not uh, are taking a long time to get to market because it, it, like I mentioned with the investment comment, you know, it, it can take nine to 10 years to get a medicine to market. Mm -hmm. So if, if we can compress that timeline, we can save lives. Um, and that is even potentially lower hanging fruit than entirely new medicines. What are the odds? I, I don't know. I, I have a running joke with my uh, co-founder Johannes, where I'll say, oh, you know, I, I, I say there's a 70% likelihood of that. Um, and he, being a trained scientist, says, what are you basing that off of? <laughs> you know, you, you, you don't have any data. You, you, you don't, where, where are your numbers? How can you back that up? Um, so, you know, I, I don't think there's any way that I'm aware of to give a, you know, a, a very specific, um, you know, estimation of the likelihood um, but I, I would say it's, I would say it's very high because it's an area that has been studied for a very long time. The intersection, I mean, um, has been studied for a very long time. The connection, as you noted, is rather obvious. Um, and the investment from the pharma world is, uh, and also the quantum computing world has been very heavy. Well, so I, I would say a high chance. Extending from that, what, 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 where do you place um, the value in individualized medicine that people sometimes talk about, where you can't do mass trials or any of those things at all, and you just want to simulate how something interacts with someone's particular genotype or something like that? I don't know if I, I simply don't know if a quantum computer um, would be able, I, personalized medicine is something that has been, um, it's been a bit of a talk about hype, uh, you know, so personalized medicine itself has been a victim of, of hype over the last number of years. Um, but it is a, um, but it's absolutely the future of, of, of medicine. Um, but I, I do not know the answer as to how a quantum computer would be able, I, I, I would hope that there would be an intersection there. Um, my guess, um, since we're all friends here, um, us, us and our listeners, um, my guess is that there, there would be some way to have advantage there um, because um, we're really talking about understanding, 
you know, the quantum computers were working under the assumption that quantum computers are going to be good at understanding the human body. And if we go with that assumption, then I think we can naturally assume that not only uh, will quantum computers be good at understanding the medicines that can treat the ailments of the human body, uh, but also potentially some of the mysteries of the human body itself um, and open the door for personalized medicine. Um, I'm going to get, I'm actually going to ask, um, my co-founder was on the board of Columbia University when they were doing a lot of work in personalized medicine. So after this conversation, I will ask her and I will, I will tweet about it and I will find out your answer for you. So one of the other things that's interesting, you mentioned that side of it, you know, going into personalized medicine and new drugs, but there's also that even earlier stage, right? It's even being able to exclude drugs in the early stage would yes. already be huge savings, right? On the 10 year timeline, you know, we say $10 billion, 10 years to create a drug. If you can even include 10% of those molecules that start at the beginning, that's already a huge impact. And quantum computers are expensive, but that's even more expensive. Yes, exactly. I, I, I mean, the, the, the list of the, the list of ways that, and th this really got me quite passionate about, about, about this, this, this is what got me passionate about quantum computing to begin with. Um, but you're right, Anastasia, the, the, the list of ways in which um, I, there's intersection between medicine. Um, and, and, and I think this is a good segue too into you know, discussing, you know, ethics in quantum computing, because there's another part of the question is not only from a technical perspective, what will a quantum computer be good for, but also who will have access to using that quantum computer. So for example, I have a friend who is a professor of biomedical engineering um, at, at a university in the United States. And she struggles to get access um, to supercomputing power that she needs um, because it's expensive. And universities have limited budgets. And if we're going to agree that, you know, hey, technically, um, and I say technically meaning from, from a, you know, a scientific uh, perspective, that yes, medicine is the lowest hanging fruit. It's something that will affect every human. It will make money, but it will also um, be good for the world. Um, how do we make sure that researchers at institutions are able to get access to these quantum computers in addition to pharmaceutical companies and also you know, other institutions like like banks and hedge funds. I don't think there's any reason a bank should be prohibited from having a quantum computer, but I think we have to think, or I said, I think twice. <laughs> we have to think pretty carefully about how we're going to allow, because as you said, computers are, quantum computers will be expensive, how we can make sure that the people who hold the keys to these breakthroughs in humanity are given access, given a chance to use these machines if they can't afford to pay out of pocket. Um, because if, when we hit quantum advantage, you know, all bets are off and quantum computers are going to be extremely, extremely expensive. Um, so, you know, one solution I have, because I like to come prepared with solutions, um, is there's always a possibility of revenue sharing. So let's say that some brilliant postdoc or professor at a university um, has a, an idea for a, a breakthrough medicine and they want to work with AeroQ on, on working on the modeling. Um, maybe we split the revenue, maybe we give it to them, not for free, but we say, you know what, you know, you can access our system, uh, without upfront charge. And then, you know, we'll own shares in your company. Um, and then we'll be able, 
uh, to both succeed when you succeed. Um, so that's just one example. Um, research credits are, of course, another one, although I think we have to go further than research credits. But who has access to what, you know, I think right now people are being a little bit short-sighted when they say, oh, you know, quantum computers, you know, are, 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 are cheap, you know, because they are right now. <laughs> you know, if you, if, you go, if you go on the cloud, you can access real quantum hardware at, uh, you know, a, a almost trivial, you know, low prices. But this is going to change overnight in a really, really severe way. And determining who gets access to this, I think, is a, res is a responsibility that we as a community have to make sure that it's equally distributed um, across the globe um, and across fields, especially ones uh, like climate. Um, and and, and I, I, I always, whenever I mention climate, I'm not one of those people who says quantum computing is going to fix climate change. Um, I, it's one of, it's a potentially a tool, but areas like climate or medicine, um, I think need to have some type of priority lane or something like that. Yeah. On, on that note, as we talk a little bit more about the ethics here, where's kind of that line between wishful thinking and fraud in terms of marketing, right? You mentioned climate, right? A lot of startups are now talking about it's going to solve climate change. We hope, right? We we hope yeah. that quantum technologies will affect all these amazing fields and change the world. But is that fraud if people really believe it? Yeah. I, I, well, you know, the 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 Theranos trial was a really interesting example of this um, in terms of how far you can go um, with uh, wishful thinking versus fraud. Um, you know, so far, you know, I have not seen any outright fraud in quantum computing. I'm, I'm sure that we will see it and we're going to, as a community, you know, spot it and, and, uh, and, 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 and be on the lookout for it and, and respond to it, hopefully. Um, but all venture capital is wishful thinking, really. Um, and you know, and, 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 and I'm speaking here, of course, from the industry perspective, um, academia has its own set of, of, of rules and guidelines. Um, but, you know, I think a something that you really believe to be true um, and isn't provably false is then it's up to the investor to make that decision. Um, but if you know something to, to be provably false, um, if you know something isn't true and you're pitching and raising money on it, then that that's fraud. So, so to me, that's the difference. Um, and is, is that, you know, do you know, you know, are, are, are you, you know, because it's very possible that, you know, quantum computing, you know, may take longer than we expect. Um, I don't want to say never because I think we're past that point now. But it's possible that quantum computing will take longer than the two to three years I mentioned to uh, have a material value. And uh, that's not fraud. That's just engineering that takes a long time. Um, and, you know, we're giving our best estimates be based on um, where we are today. So I, th I think, again, in terms of ethics, you, you have to say what you really believe. Um, and you have to be honest about the risks. And I think this is really where some people get caught up with investors is that they're not honest enough about the risks. Um, and, and what can go wrong. Uh, so I think is if you're, if, if you really believe in what you're doing, um, and you are upfront about the risks and the timeline, then I think that's fair game. So in a, in a, in a field like quantum, where 
you know, we're using terms like entanglement and uh, quantum channel capacities and, um, you know, uh, decoherence times and um, accelerated advantage through uh, entanglement. Um, these are a lot of terms that, you know, people outside a relatively narrow field don't understand, but we have big dollars coming into it from governments and uh, venture capital. Um, do you think there's a need for some kind of guardrails there, or at least some kind of sanity check? I don't know, maybe through adoption or, you know, use of standards that could um, kind of deflect bad investment just from misunderstanding the terms um, and promote good investment. Yes, I do. Um, I, I think this is, um, and again, I'll give a shout out to a Anastasia for her excellent content. Um, but I, I think this is one thing that we believe strongly at, at AeroQ uh, is that we have to have a multidisciplinary dialogue around creating ethics of quantum and around explaining quantum. So our vision is, is fairly simple. What we're trying to do and, and, and will do is, is on our end, I'll give you an example. So we're starting with a gathering of 20 or 30 folks from completely different disciplines, even including religious leaders. Um, in addition to uh, eth uh, bioethicists, uh, doctors, uh, lawyers, policymakers, um, and explaining to them, you know, what these terms mean, uh, in investors as well, um, what these terms mean, what are the basics, and then word can spread very quickly in a community. So our hope is that we can seed these conversations. But right now, the, the, the problem, I think, Gavin, is, is that we have been very insular as a field. Um, and I think that's where the sanity check needs to happen, is, is we need to start as a field uh, going to you know, less quantum computing conferences um, and start going to more, you know, general conferences, um, and, and standards, I, I like, I, I'm standards. That's a really interesting idea. I had never thought about that before, but I think it's a lot about education and about going outside of our community, um, and taking content that's understandable, um, and especially presenting that to immediate stakeholders like investors, doctors, um, researchers, um, but also really opening the net because this is something that's going to impact a lot of people. Um, so I, I, I think we need to have a, a multidisciplinary dialogue. Um, and I think your, your point about standards um, could be really interesting. I don't yeah, know definitely. what they'd look like yet, but I, I like it. So definitely there's a lot I still want to ask you about in terms of ethics and arrow Q, but yes. just really quickly, we're wrapping up. Um, how are you guys positioning yourself as against competitors in the quantum space? And where can people stay updated with the latest news and developments in at arrow Q and with you? That, 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 that's uh, that's an easy one. Um, we're differentiated because we are the only company that is developing a quantum computer using electrons floating on the surface of superfluid helium. Uh, so I'll give you a 30 second summary of our technology. Um, uh, but essentially uh, we have, we had a very long stealth period um, and certainly some companies may uh, pop up and compete with us, and we welcome that. Um, but we have a, a very, very, very long, long head start, uh, including intellectual property, on the system of using an electron 
that is, so you have a, a CMOS produced foundry chip, then you have a, a, a thin layer of liquid helium. And then right above that, you have electrons that are attracted to their own image beneath the helium. Um, and then are able to be controlled with a uh, little, little electrode. So um, we are the only company that's pursuing this technology and that's how we differentiate. And because I don't think it will be winner take all, um, we're just, we are not, um, you know, focused on, you know, beating up any of our competitors um, unless they make, you know, false claims. Um, you know, we're really just focused on, building what we know we can build, which is an electron and helium quantum computer. So our, our, the way we differentiate is by being the only company doing this. Um, and then finally, uh, for me, um, AeroQ, it's uh, eeroq.com. Um, so uh, on our website, we've got a news section. Uh, so we update that pretty regularly for all the latest news. Um, and I'm on Twitter a little bit less than I used to be, um, but you can still find me there at uh, Nick underscore Farina. Um, and would love to engage with any questions uh, folks have from the show. And thank you so much for having me. Um, it was great to see everyone again. Um, really appreciated the questions. Um, and um, yeah, thank you again. Thanks, Nick. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Thank Thanks, you. Nick, for coming on the show, The Quantum State. Thank you, Peter and Gavin, for co-hosting with me. So if you are listening to this on YouTube, leave comments below. We'll pass it on to Nick and the rest of the team and hopefully answer some questions next time. Hopefully, Nick, you can come back because this was a great conversation. So make sure to subscribe on YouTube. You can find us also on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And thank you so much and talk to you next time. Thanks. I would love to come back. Thanks again, Anastasia. Bye now.